This is ABTV, Animal Bites Television. You know, it's hard to believe, but I've been breeding snakes professionally for 26 years. Sometimes I think about that and I think, oh my God, that is a long time to be working with animals. And trust me, there's a lot of ups and downs in that period of time. But one of the things that's probably the coolest part of your job, because you work so hard raising snakes and, and putting them together and breeding them and feeding them and cleaning them, is collecting eggs. I mean, when you do that, you just feel so accomplished. This happens to be a lemon blast, het for azanthic, bred to an azanthic pinstripe. So uh, uh, there you go. Now it's a pretty small clutch of eggs, to be honest with you. There's only four eggs in here. And uh, yeah, but she's a pretty small girl. She's probably only about 1,500 grams when she's completely full. So right now she's a lot less because she just laid those eggs. But the point is, is that this is kind of the payoff. You know what I mean? It's like you've worked all this year working towards breeding stuff. And then finally, you get these pearly white beautiful eggs. I'm just putting them in this incubator box, get them in the incubator, and hopefully after 60 days, we're gonna hatch some really gorgeous animals. Things like azanthic lemon blast, azanthic pinstripes, pastel azanthics, all kinds of cool stuff. That's kind of the, the thrill of breeding snakes. It's just cool to see that. But after 26 years, honestly, there's been a lot of ups and downs, but the one thing is there's certainly keys to the success. This week's show, I'm gonna tell you the 10 keys to being a successful reptile breeder. My name is Brian Barczyk. I'm no zoologist, just a guy with a passion for animals. And that passion often takes me on animal adventures around the world. This week, I'll be talking about the 10 keys to being a successful reptile breeder. You're watching Snake Bites. The first key is certainly to choose animals that you really want to work with. A lot of times people make the mistake of going after animals that are kind of in vogue or they think that they're a great investment. You know, I've always loved ball pythons. They've just always been something that I've been really passionate about. Again, I've always said that one of the first things I ever remember as a person was seeing a ball python at a zoo. So ever since then, I've just been addicted to them. And the funny thing is, is over the last 15 to 17 years, ball pythons have completely reigned supreme and been one of the best investments out there. And this little Cine Lesser is a feisty little bugger, isn't he? But the truth is, when I started working with ball pythons, believe it or not, they were considered garbage animals. As a matter of fact, I remember one time being at a reptile convention in Baltimore, Maryland, and when I was out to dinner with a handful of reputable reptile breeders, and they were making fun of me because I worked with ball pythons. I remember them saying, why would you work with garbage animals that no one wants? My point is, is that things like this beautiful spinner blast is something that I work with because I love them. Now, of course, you want to make proper decisions. You don't want to work with things that are going to completely just be worthless. I shouldn't say that because nothing is worthless. And I work with a lot of animals, to be honest with you, that don't make me any money at all just because I love them. But if you want to be a successful breeder, you do have to think about it a little bit from a business sense. Something like this Super Dragonfly is a beautiful snake and it's a great investment. But again, I never work with any project just for the money. I work with them because they're gorgeous and I just love working with them. You have to remember, every day that you're opening that cage and cleaning it, you have to get enjoyment out of it. And if you're not getting enjoyment out of it, you're certainly not gonna be successful. But it's not always been about ball pythons. One of my first loves in snakes, and certainly breeding snakes, happened to be corn snakes. It was really the first snake that I actually successfully bred and hatched out. I hatched out some animals prior that were from a wild caught female that laid eggs. But corn snakes are really what started my breeding, which was pretty amazing, really. But I could never have expected 20 something years later for snakes to look like this. This is just unbelievably pink coral snow corn snake. We're working with this pink gene in a bunch of different corn snakes, blacks, ghosts, a whole bunch of things. And it's just amazing. It's a polygenic trait, which just basically means it's been years and years of breeding pink animals to pink animals to continue to make the pinker and pinker snakes. But corn snakes are a great opportunity if someone wants to breed kind of a little bit larger volume in a small amount of space. As you can see in a rack like this, there's 12 high rack. You can fit, you know, two males, in 10 females, that's a lot of production out of a small area. But again, you've gotta do it because you really love the animal. But I love corn snakes and I love producing a lot of them. So these guys were definitely high on my list for passions. My latest passion is certainly 
blue tongue skinks. I have become completely obsessed with blue tongue skinks. Things like this sunset northern blue tongue that is just absolutely mind bending to me is what I've recently just been completely enthralled with. Now there's really two things going on here. First off, I just love the animals. I love their attitude. I love that they're kind of big but they're not too big. I love the fact that they're super easy to care for. To me, they're kind of the perfect pet lizard and they are unbelievably adorable. With that said, there is a business side to it because to be honest with you, I really predict that blue tongue skinks over the next two to three years will make a huge impact in the market and that people will continue to want them more and more and trust me the demand is pretty high right now and as a matter of fact i gotta be honest i'm pretty excited right now because i just got a shipment in from my buddy austin from arizona He's affectionately known as Austin Blue Tongue Skink because that's basically what he does. He's amazing with Blue Tongue Skinks. And I got these guys in this morning and take a look at these things. Oh my gosh, I was so excited when they finally came in. And they are gorgeous little guys and I'm just about to set them up. Well, come on little monkey, get out of there. <laughs> I tell you what, I tell you, lizards are a little different than snakes because they have claws and they can hang on to the bags. But take a look at that. Oh my gosh, now this is actually a genetic hypo eastern blue tongue skinks. Now the sunset were the northern blue tongues and these are the easterns. Now the easterns are typically a little bit more slender body. They don't have that eye band that typically northerns have and man, that thing is gorgeous. You can see why I'm just getting so interested in these amazing, amazing lizards. So my point is, first thing you gotta do, work with animals you love. The second key to success is do your research. I cannot express enough that you need to research prior to getting your snake or your reptile. You never wanna get an animal and then try to figure it out. Don't get me wrong, once you are working with an animal, you're gonna learn a lot more about it than even research will tell you. As a matter of fact, you may learn some things that other people don't know, which is really cool. So experience is very important too, but prior to getting the animal, learn as much as you possibly can. Take for instance, these rhino rat snakes. For years and years I wanted to work with them and I learned all about them prior to getting my first pair. For instance, the babies oftentimes want to eat fish. So if I didn't know that and I hatched successfully hatched a clutch of rhino rats and then they wouldn't eat for me, there's a chance they could have perished because I didn't do my proper research. Now with these guys, typically you just feed them fish for a little while, then fish set in pinkies and then eventually pinkies and then they do great. So that research really helped prepare me to be as successful as I could, not only with keeping, breeding, hatching, but also raising the babies. Or let's say, for instance, Honduran milk snakes. You know, sure, they're just a colubrid, seems pretty straightforward, but the difference is, is say you have a bunch of corn snakes that are eating mice, well obviously most Hondurans eat rats. So you wanna do your research to make sure that you can get a rodent source to get the rats that you need to feed that animal. Or let's go even one step further. Let's say you work with boas or ball pythons or carpet pythons or whatever it is, and you wanna add a corn snake group into your room. Well, the truth is they're not gonna do that well because those boas and pythons need it about four degrees warmer than a corn snake. If you keep a corn snake colony in a room too warm, all you're gonna get is slug eggs and you're gonna be completely unsuccessful. So research each animal you get and each project you get and make sure you have what you need to be successful. The next thing would be to certainly start small. Get your feet wet a little bit. You never wanna jump in with both feet and get yourself over your head. The truth is, I don't follow my own advice too well. Typically everything I do is big and grandiose and, and even leopard geckos, for instance, you know, I just started breeding leopard geckos. It's only my third breeding season, to be honest with you. I produced a couple clutches here or there, but, but you know, really working on the project a lot. And you can see, look at all these little babies here. Every of these babies are what hatches almost every single day. So we're gonna be producing literally thousands of baby leopard geckos over the next couple months. And we have some really amazing, beautiful animals and they're so cheeky. I just absolutely love them when they first come out of the egg. And we keep them in these cups like this so that we can separate which clutches they are so we can keep a really good track of it. But my point is, is if you're getting over your head and you produce thousands of leopard geckos or thousands of corn snakes or whatever the case may be, you know, you're probably not gonna be very successful because the one thing you don't wanna do is overproduce your ability to care for the animal. Whether it's having enough cages or it's having enough food or help or whatever the case may be, it's really important to make sure that you're prepared for everything that you're gonna produce. So, you know, I always tell people, don't produce 
5,000 leopard geckos. Produce 50 or 25 leopard geckos that first season. Kind of get your feet wet. Know what you're doing so that that way you can see what you're going to need when you expand on it. And the truth is, guys, to be honest with you, I always say the difference between taking care of 100 animals and 1,000 animals isn't really 10 times the number. It's really more like two or maybe three times the number. Because again, this whole rack is just baby leopard geckos that we've hatched in the last couple of weeks. You know, it doesn't take that much longer to feed and water all of them than say one rack because you're already your water bucket set, your cups are out, your food's out, whatever the case is. So again, it doesn't take 10 times longer to do 10 racks, but it does take two or three times longer. So if you do one rack of leopard geckos or corn snakes or ball pythons, it gives you an idea of what it's going to be like when you have a lot of animals to take care of. So start small, don't get yourself over crazy. Hey, listen, if you want to be a big breeder one day, trust me, you'll be okay. Just take your time and start off with baby steps. Next up would be planning and budgeting. I tell you, the thing that I hear mostly with amateur or beginning snake enthusiasts that want to eventually breed snakes is the fact that they save up to buy a beautiful snake like this leucistic scaleless Texas rat snake. And they've been saving for months to finally get that animal or say a pair of animals and they're gonna breed them. Well, the flaw in that is that there's a whole lot more than just buying a snake, right? You have to plan and you have to budget for everything. It's not just the snake. It's the snake, it's the cage, it's the rack system. Hey, it's even the bowl or cups or whatever the case may be that you're gonna buy. You also have to budget for how much money it's gonna cost to raise that snake. So it's pinky mice or it's rats or whatever it may be, you have to pay for that. Hey, you also have to heat it, right? So there's gonna be electricity. And let's say you take the plunge and you start growing and you have some employees. You've gotta take that into effect. Now you have to take into effect that you have to have boxes to ship babies when you sell them. You have to have advertising, whatever you might spend, to try to get people to know who you are. You may have to travel to a reptile show. You may have to buy displays to actually display your animals at that reptile show, right? So make sure that you plan and budget. Trust me, it's not just about the snake. The snake is only a small part of the money that you're gonna to have to spend if you wanna be a successful reptile breeder. Next up would be buy from a reputable breeder or wholesaler or pet shop or whatever it might be. I personally like to buy from a breeders, but of course I'm a breeder so I'm a little bit biased. But the truth is there's plenty of local pet shops that are really good and there's certainly wholesalers you can find online and, and even at reptile shows, you know, it's really good. But it's really important and I can't stress enough how you got to buy from somebody that is not only reputable, but also is willing to help you after the sale, right? Because let's face it, a lot of people will put a lot of time and energy into trying to get you to buy a snake. But the truth is, that's only half the battle. Once you actually purchase that animal, you might have issues, you might have problems, you might just have questions. And it's really important to make sure that you have somebody, whether it's a pet shop or a breeder or whatever it might be, that's willing to answer those questions and support you after the sale. Again, anyone can support you before the sale. Real, true, reputable people support you after the sale and make sure, and trust me, if you start getting into breeding snakes, you're gonna have a ton of questions. And the one thing about any live animal, whether it's snakes, lizards, dogs, cats, whatever it might be, you will have problems at some point. Who knows what that problem's gonna be, but it's really nice to have someone that's on your side that's been through those issues that can kinda help walk you through it. And I'm gonna be honest with you, a tremendous amount of time that we spend here up front in the offices at BHB is fielding calls from people that bought animals from other people that aren't giving them any support whatsoever. Maybe they had a, a sick animal or, or, or whatever the case may be. The point is, is that you know they're lost because they're trying to find support they have nowhere to look. And the truth is, a good breeder is gonna help someone that didn't buy a snake from them as much as someone that is gonna buy a snake from them. Because after all, we're in this for the love of animals. So make sure you deal with people that, that aren't gonna just support you because you're buying, but are willing to support you on other endeavors too. Let's say you already had snakes and you had questions. If the person that you're trying to buy from is like, well, hey, that's not my problem, contact the person you bought from, to me, I don't support those guys, you know what I mean? I wanna support people that love the animals, are doing it for the right reasons, and are gonna be there for you, not just now, but a month from now, a year from now, five years from now, whatever it might be. So I can't stress enough how important it is to put your money and your support behind somebody that is reputable and really about the right principles. The next important step, and I really think this is an important one, is be patient. I tell you what, 
Reptiles aren't going anywhere, and neither is the hobby, to be honest with you. One of the things I think people make a huge mistake of is they start chasing projects. They start thinking like, oh my gosh, I've gotta buy it. If I don't buy it today, the price is gonna double or I'm not gonna make my return back or you know, whatever the case may be. The truth is the best thing you can do when you're working with any animal for that matter is be patient. If you wanna be a breeder and you wanna be successful, it's gonna happen, but it's gonna take a little bit of time. A good example I wanna share with you right now are these guys. These are John Eye, or Indian Smooth Scale Sand Boas. Believe it or not, I bought these guys, including the Sunsets, which are right here, uh, almost seven years ago. That's right, six and a half years ago, I bought these guys as babies. This is an adult male that actually is gonna father a litter, the first litter, hopefully this year. Uh, and they don't get much larger than this and they're really gorgeous. But the fact is, is that I waited almost seven years before they were finally sexually mature. Unfortunately, a lot of sambo is not so much Kenyans or rough scales, but the John I often take between five and seven years to finally reach sexual maturity. And every year I would put them together and wouldn't even see breeding. Well, finally this year, these males decided they were gonna start breeding and it looks like we have a handful of gravid females. So we may get our first baby Babies. My point is, is that it took a long time. I was patient. Am I gonna make tons of money? Is there even a chance I'm gonna return on my investment? I don't know because John and I only have anywhere from three to seven babies and it's not like they're super expensive. And the fact that I have six and a half years of time and money and effort into them, maybe it wasn't the best investment. But my point is, is that you have to be patient to produce animals. Whether it's a ball python, a corn snake, a reticulated python, a monitor lizard, a bearded dragon, it doesn't really matter. You have to be patient. I personally like to put plenty of time into my animals prior to working on breeding them. That way you really get to know the animals, you know the history, and don't worry about catching up to other people. Trust me, move at your own pace, be patient, and you're gonna be way better off in the end. Create a demand for your animals. What I mean by that is be a part of the community, contribute to that community, the reptile community. You know, get on Facebook, get on Twitter, Instagram, whatever it might be, and start to develop a persona that people know. The fact is, people wanna support people that they're familiar with. But it's not just about the exposure, it's about being part of the community. Again, it's like I said, contribute, answer people's questions, do the best you can do to educate people about animals. When people start to see what your character is they have a better chance of wanting to support that positive character and speaking about that the last thing you want to do is be posting a bunch of negative things and attacking people whenever people see someone like that they typically want to shy away so always try to rise above put on a professional face but always try to be positive as well trust me it's going to reward you in the long run now this one might be tough for some people but it's really really important and that is to work hard. I cannot express how important it is to make sure that you are working harder than your competition. It's all about doing whatever it takes to be successful. And you know what, typically my normal day starts at 7 a.m. and I usually work till about 11 o'clock every single night. Sure, you know, I take some breaks and, and it's not like I'm, you know, killing myself doing manual labor or something like that, although sometimes I am. Um, I love what I do, but I work harder than anybody. And I've always had that kind of attitude, like, you know what, if I work harder than my competition, I'm gonna do better than my competition. And not just harder, but work smarter as well. But the truth is, when I was younger, you know, in my early 20s, a lot of my friends would be going out you know, to the bars or going out to parties, hanging out or whatever, and you know what I was doing? I was back in my snake room cleaning snakes, feeding snakes, trying to better myself. And it's really a situation where, it's about what you put into it. If you put a lot of hard work into breeding or whatever, it doesn't even matter if it's reptiles, to be honest with you, just in life in general, you have to work hard. And if you don't work hard, you're not gonna achieve much. And a lot of times people make that mistake. They think it's easy, you know? They think, oh, you know, I'm just gonna get a couple animals, I'm gonna throw them together, they're gonna have babies and I'm gonna make a million dollars. Well, it can't be further from the truth. You have to work your butt off to be successful and especially probably harder with animals to be honest with you because when it comes to animals of course you've got to make sure that you know you're there all the time i always tell people animals don't take holidays they don't take vacations 
there's no weekends in the animal world, right? It's every day you have to work with them, whether it's feeding, cleaning, breeding, whatever it is. I tell you, I, I'm not gonna lie to you. There's been many days, especially on the weekends when I'm in town or a holiday, like I was saying, where the last thing I wanna do is come in and leave my family and work on switching male ball pythons or colubrids or whatever the case is. You know, not that I don't love doing it, but the fact is, is that you know, on certain days, you just wanna chill out. You know, you're just like, hey, I just wanna stay home for a day and enjoy my family or enjoy my friends or whatever the case is. The fact is, you gotta get your butt in there and you gotta do the work, because the harder you work, the more successful you're gonna be. And the last thing to the key to being a successful reptile breeder is, of course, just have a good time. After all, this is our passion, right? It was our hobby for the most part. Now, don't turn it into a job. Sure, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that there aren't days that it feels like I'm working, but the truth is, the vast majority of the time, this is what I would be doing if it wasn't what I do for a living. I love it, I love every minute of it, and you should too. One of the things that's really difficult when you transition from a complete hobby to trying to make it into a profession is that you start to lose the passion that brought you in that direction. Don't let that happen. Always make sure you keep your eye on the thing that was important that got you started, and that's your love of animals. Because trust me, after 26 years of doing this full time, I still love the animals as much, probably even more than I ever have. If you follow those rules, you're gonna be as successful as I am. I hope this helped you guys a lot, and as always, I was Facebooking and tweeting my way through it. So make sure to follow me over at SnakeBitesTV and on Instagram at SnakeBites.tv. Until next week, you've been watching Snake Bites. Welcome to the Conservation Files. My name is Ben Desson, and for as long as I can remember, I've been incredibly passionate about wildlife and the environment. In this series, I'm gonna showcase some amazing wildlife. This is ABTV.